Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, while we give everyone a, a, a moment or two to join, um, why don't you get in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from so we know. Who do we have with us today? Where are you joining us from? Tell us in the chat. We got Patricia from Milford, and Donna from Milford, Connecticut. Oh boy, let's see if I can pronounce this one. North Constantia, New York. Meridian, Carbondale, Colorado. Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Seabrook Island, South Carolina. Danbury, New York City. Rockaway. Queens. Is there closed caption capability? Um, if our IT person can uh, can answer that, we've had that in the past. I don't know if we'll be able to do that, but we'll we'll get our best people on it right now. Uh, Islip, Long Island, Massapequa. Hi, my name is Rich Merritt, and I'll be your host today. This webinar is brought to you by the Audubon State Offices of Connecticut and New York, whose mission it is to protect birds in the places we all need in our forests, on our coasts, and across local communities. Uh, note that this webinar is being recorded and will soon be available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Questions are welcome in the chat box at any time, and we will have time at the end for Q&A. Um, today's webinar is about coastal stewardship and the efforts that are being made to make beaches safer for birds. And with us today to present on this topic is Corey Folsom O'Keefe and Shelby Casas. Corey is the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut, and in this position, she oversees Audubon's coastal stewardship and resilience efforts. Corey leads the Audubon Alliance for Coastal Water Birds, which assists the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's Wildlife Division with the management of the piping plover and other beach nesting birds. She also oversees the Wildlife Guards Program, which educates, mentors, and employs Bridgeport and West Haven High School students as beach nesting bird stewards. And with us is Shelby Casas, the Postal Program Associate for Audubon, New York, based at the Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Center in Oyster Bay. She oversees the monitoring and stewardship for federal and state shorebirds of concern for Audubon on multiple sites across Long Island. Good afternoon, Corey and Shelby, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us, Rich. All right. Shall we go ahead and get started? Please do. Everyone's anxious to see what you're going to talk about today, so thank you. Okay. Well, good evening all, I mean, good afternoon all, and thank you for joining us for Audubon Connecticut's monthly webinar. Today's presentation is on the birds that use our coasts, the work that Audubon does to steward these species, and how you can help. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the National Audubon Society, which Connecticut and New York are a field office of. The National Audubon Society's mission is to protect birds and the places they need today and tomorrow. Through science, advocacy, education, and on-the-ground conservation, we are protecting birds and the places they need throughout their life cycles, on the breeding and wintering grounds, and also at the places that they stop between the two. In addition, our state programs, nature centers, chapters, and partners reach millions of people each year to inform, inspire, and, in and unite diverse communities in conservation action. We believe in a world in which people and wildlife thrive. If we protect the bird birds, we protect the earth. We will start today's presentation with an overview of the flyways and then focus in on shorebirds and seabirds that use the Atlantic flyway. You'll hear about the threats these birds face and how Audubon and partners are working to reduce threats. We'll conclude with information on how you can help these incredible birds successfully raise their young and reach their destinations. Birds are amazing. They travel the globe as they go between their wintering and breeding grounds, often stopping to rest and refuel along the way. Shorebirds and seabirds have some of the longest migrations of all birds. In fact, two thirds of shorebird species that breed in North America travel from breeding grounds in the Arctic to wintering grounds in Central and South America. The Arctic Tern has one of the longest migrations, between 37 and 50,000 miles a year as it travels between the Arctic and the Antarctic. For shorebirds, spring migration tends to be quick with adults birds, birds rushing to the breeding, breeding grounds in hope of getting the best territory and a mate, while fall migration extends over a larger period and includes a mix of adults and the young of the year. 
During these journeys, stopover habitat, places with abundant food resources where birds can replenish their energy reserves quickly are critical. Stopover habitats aren't just on the coast. For example, the Cheyenne Bottoms in central Kansas includes more than 15,000 acres of wetlands. Located at the heart of the central flyway, 39 species of shorebirds have been spotted at the bottoms. And for 10 of those species, significant population, significant percentages of their populations staged at Cheyenne Bottoms. To ensure that we have healthy shorebird populations into the future, the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network was launched in 1985. This voluntary network of 114 sites and 434 partners working in 18 countries includes 38.6 million acres. These sites are managed for effective conservation resulting in healthy shorebird populations and habitats. A number of network sites are within the Atlantic Flyway and include the Altamaha River Delta in Georgia, Georgia, the Barrier Islands of Maryland and Virginia, the Delaware Bay, Edward B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge in New Jersey, Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge and Great Marsh in Massachusetts and the Bay of Fundy. At this point, I'm gonna pass the mic to Shelby to tell you about some of the bird species that use these sites and other sites along the Atlantic Flyway. Unmute yourself, Shelby. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So in partner with local, state, and um, regional government agencies, Audubon chapters, land managers, and other conservation partners, Audubon, Connecticut, New York, work to protect bri priority shorebird and seabird species, all of which are either endangered, threatened, or at risk during their nesting and migratory journey. A few of the species we're going to cover today are the piping plover, the American oyster catcher, and the leaf tern. Um, these beach nesting birds nest on um, sandy beaches and islands across New York and Connecticut. Uh, the beach is where they have habitat to nest, um, and the water is where they have their food. The piping plover, uh, like many of these species, is a migratory uh, bird spending its winters in the southern hemisphere, including areas like the Bahamas. During the spring, they migrate north to their breeding habitat, uh, which includes Connecticut and New York. These birds use this time to establish territories, find mates, and start their limited breeding season. Piping plovers are territorial nesters and will defend their nesting area, mate, chick, if a new plover enters territory during the nesting season. They lay around three to four eggs in a shallow depression called a scrape. We seem to have some technological issues here, Shelby. I think it's, it looks like you're back. I think I just saw your screen move, but we lost everything from when you said uh, the nest is called a scrape. So sorry about that. So the nest is called a scrape. Uh, you can see an example of that in the top right corner. Uh, these nests are well camouflaged uh, to hide them from predators. The pair will incubate these eggs for about a month. Once the chicks hatch, they are precocial birds which means within hours of hatching, these chicks will follow their parents to food sources and forage for their own food. Adults will spend the next month with the chicks, protecting them from a wide range of predators and threats until they are able to fly and head down south for their wintering season. Additionally, American oyster catchers follow a similar breeding schedule as piping plovers, migrating north in mid-March to early April, establishing territories and finding mates. American oyster catchers are also territorial nesters, performing vocal territorial displays with other American oyster catcher adults and pairs that encroach on their territory during this time. American oyster catchers nest in a variety of coastal habitats, including sandy and rocky beaches, marsh, shell, and rocky islands, and have even uh, nested on gravel rooftops in North Carolina and Florida. They lay around two to three eggs in late April to early May and will attempt to re-nest like many of these shorebirds if their initial nest fails. American oyster catcher chicks are also precocial, 
which allows them to forage uh, within hours of hatching. The chicks will stay with the adult well after fledging, uh, which means they can fly, and often join the staging groups in August and September, where they'll spend with large numbers of other American oyster catcher groups before they head to their wintering grounds, which include New Jersey all the way south to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the last uh, breeding bird that we are going to cover is the least tern. They arrive in the nesting habitat around mid-May to early June, where they establish large groups of nesting pairs called a colony. This colony nesting habitat provides protection for not only the tern colony, but also nearby nesting shorebirds, like the piping plover and the American oyster catcher. They nest near bodies of water, including sandy and shelly beaches and islands. Each pair lays around one to two eggs in a nest, and they forage on small fish in nearby areas, including sand lace and menhaden. Generally, least terns return each year to past nest sites, but can change, but changes in nearby prey, available um, uh, nearby human activity, substrate conditions can prompt them to make a move to a, a different site. Turn chicks are semi-percultural, unlike the American oyster catcher and the piping plover. So when they hatch, even though they hatch well-developed, they do rely on their parents for food. And often these chicks will seek food from their parents uh, well after leaving the nest and once they're fledged in the bottom uh, right corner, you can see um, a well-fledged uh, least turn chick still seeking food from their parents. One other species we want to mention is the semi-palmated sandpiper. This robin-sized shorebird doesn't nest in the United States, but our shores and wetlands along the flyway are vital to this species during migration. In spring, huge numbers stop in the Delaware Bay to forage alongside side red knots and horseshoe crab eggs. And during fall migration, if I can get this, oh, I missed, it. if I get this video to play, uh, I'm having trouble getting the video to play. So it, it is what it is. Oh, there, here we go. Oh. There we go. During fall migration, bird watchers will find large groups at many locations along the Atlantic coast. For example, Connecticut has three globally important bird areas for semi-palmated sandpiper, where thousands of individuals can be seen from late July to early August. This is a video from Stratford Point, which is located at the mouth of the Housatonic River. And you can see all the semi-palmated sandpipers as well as some ruddy turnstones and dunlins uh, actively foraging along the shoreline um, at a sort of mid tide and rising. Okay, Shelby, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to talk about the threats that some of these birds face. Uh, so piping plovers um, were actually driven to near extinction around the turn of the century by extensive hunting uh, for meat, sport, and for the millinery industry. Uh, with the passing of the Migratory Be Bird Treaty Act in 1918, uh, piping plovers began to recover by the mid-1920s. Um, the, mid the population peaked around the 40s, but declined once again um, due to development and recreation following World War II. So continued human pressure, such as coastal development, recreational activities, and disturbance by off-road vehicles have reduced the available suitable breeding habitat for both the piping plovers and other shorebirds. In 1986, the piping plover was listed as threatened and endangered on the Endangered Species Act. Currently, um, beach nesting birds face many threats, including sea level rise, habitat loss, and predation from non and native predators. With increasing damage to coastal areas by storms and flooding on the rise, shorebirds can lose nesting habitat both before and during the nesting season. Often nesting areas can flood during the breeding season, lead, leading to a loss of a nest. Um, in the bottom right picture, you can see a flooded nesting area on Long Island, 
which includes a piping plover nest exposure. Losses, loss of nests during the breeding season can cause a pair to restart their nest later in the season during the hotter months when they do lead to more heat exposure to the eggs. Additionally, these birds um, need to evade a variety of predators, both avian and mammal. Predators can eat eggs or young chicks. And often these predators hunt at night like foxes and can only be identified as the predator that caused the nest failure through tracks or through predator cameras set up at nesting sites. Human disturbance poses a major threat to both beach nesting and migratory shorebirds. Beach recreationists and cars can crush eggs and scare predators off a nest, exposing eggs to the sun and extreme temperatures. Also to nearby predators and interrupt foraging and roosting. Trash left at a nest site or washed up can entangle birds or can be in ingested. Trash attracts predators like crows and raccoons, leading, leading them to nearby nests. Additionally, dogs, especially off-leash dogs, can scare birds and accidentally injure um, unfledged chicks, as well as exhaust migratory shorebirds at their limited resting stopovers. Each year, Audubon partners and many, many volunteers work to reduce threats to shorebirds and three seabirds through habitat management, outreach and education, and monitoring and research. At nest sites, a number of strategies are used to reduce disturbance. For example, symbolic string fencing and signs alert visitors to nesting areas, and exclosures prevent larger predators from accessing eggs. Habitat can also be enhanced. A simple way to improve habitat for seabirds is to build turn shelters. Audubon New York um, and partners from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Audubon Chapters and the town of Brookhaven uh, annually make shelters for least common and roseate terns. Sometimes habitat needs more intense restoration. Beach nesting birds are often leery of vegetation which can conceal predators. Strong storms like hurricanes and nor'easters can prevent vegetation from being established, but sometimes it is necessary for humans to lend a helping hand. A multi-phase restoration project at Barnegat Light enhanced habitat for both nesting and migratory shorebirds and seabirds by removing vegetation, creating high quality foraging habitat in the form of a shallow pond and fence the habitat post restoration. This project wouldn't have been successful without a strong partnership supporting it. And this is something that is true at many sites where shorebirds and seabirds are nesting. Partnership is key. Management ensures that birds are prote have protected healthy habitats to nest and rest, but we also need to make sure that visitors to these sites are aware of the birds and the little things that they can do to help. Our outreach and education programs reach visitors of all ages and through these programs, we strive to provide a ladder to careers in conservation for students of all backgrounds. On the Long Island, on Long Island Sound, the TR Audubon Center educate, um, educators visit local elementary schools and teach students about coastal ecology, how to identify uh, their, their local uh, beach nesting bird species and threats those birds face. After lessons, these kids work with their teachers to design, share the shore signs with their own messaging and artwork. Uh, a few of these designs are made, are made into weather resistant signs that get posted um, on local beaches with our uh, regulatory government signs. Um, as Audubon uh, thrives to continue to engage uh, uh, youth and volunteer work and uh, job opportunities, Audubon, Connecticut established the Wildlife Guard Program in 2012 to employ local high school students and college age crew leaders from West Haven and the Bridgeport area. These students serve as official monitors uh, tasked with tracking the reproductive success of state threatened birds, 
uh, sharing their knowledge and engaging the public in protection of the Long Island Sound. On Long Island, Audubon runs the Be A Good Ape outreach program with volunteers, Audubon chapters, and local partners. The goal is to reduce human disturbance threats through uh, educating beachgoers and encouraging people to sign the Be A Good Ape pledge to share the shore with shorebirds and seabirds. From June to August, Be A Good Ape tables are set up at priority nesting sites across Long Island Sound, asking guests to sign the Be A Good Ape pledge to respect fenced off areas, keep beaches clean and carry out trash and keep dogs off nesting beaches or leashed. The last component of our Coastal Stewardship work is monitoring and research. Monitoring is required to understand if we are achieving recovery plan goals for threatened species. For example, the piping plover Atlantic coast Population Revised Recovery Plan calls for 2,000 pairs along the East Coast and a five-year average productivity of 1.5 pledged chicks per pair. Each state along the flyway has a pair number goal and a lot of work goes into reaching those productivity, that productivity goal every year. Research also helps us better understand the needs of bird species that we are working to protect. In Connecticut, we have an oyster catcher banding program and have been working to band our oyster catcher population since 2018. Through banding, we are learning more about the wintering locations of oyster catchers that nest in Connecticut, staging areas that they use uh, prior to the breeding season and post breeding season, survival and lifetime productivity, and also mate and site fidelity. In Connecticut, we definitely have birds that have switched mates and also birds that have switched nesting sites. And in Connecticut, there's actually a, a threesome uh, oyster catcher uh, group uh, that is uh, pretty interesting to study. In 2018, Audubon New York and Connecticut partnered with Virginia Tech and groups along the Atlantic Flyway in a shorebird disturbance survey project from 2018 to 2020, staff conducted surveys assessing types of disturbance, frequency, and shorebird behavior from March to October, covering their nesting and migratory season. In 2021, both Connecticut and New York uh, joined the phase three of this project uh, to implement management strategies to reduce specific disturbance types researched in phase one, uh, which include dog walkers, and promoting beachgoers to giving birds space. Now, how can you help? One of the, the our greatest um, ways that we work to promoting shorebird success is getting people involved, educating people in uh, the shorebirds and attending presentations like this. So step one, we always ask people uh, to be a good egg, um, whether that's taking the pledge uh, but also just remembering um, our share the shore messaging, um, which Corey's going to cover a little bit more. Um, during the breeding season, which is right now, um, we ask people to respect that fencing area and exposures, uh, keep pets, pets off of nesting beaches, or, or to check uh, dog rules for beaches you're visiting, and observe the tide um, when you're visiting your local beaches. Um, and then the last step is always um, if you can, to volunteer to locate a Audubon chapter or conservation group near you. Um, and you've already done one of these steps, um, attend the shorebird presentation. So uh, for the last few minutes of the presentation, we just wanna give you some tips for visiting the beaches this summer, particularly if you are visiting beaches that have nesting bird populations. Um, so there are, are good times to visit the beach and there are you know, maybe not so good times to, beach, to visit the beach. Uh, for example, in Connecticut and New York, um, you know, our piping plovers and oyster catchers arrive in March and they're sort of setting up their nesting ter territories, um, laying their eggs um, and incubating their eggs from the period of March to early May. Um, and then later on in the season, September and October, um, you know, our piping plovers and oyster catchers are, are you know, they've fledged their young, they're moving around 
plovers might already be back in the Bahamas, um, but we have migratory shorebirds coming in. Um, I mentioned earlier that the, the fall migration period is you know, roughly from, from the end of June through uh, December. So you can see a nice variety of shorebirds on the beach in September and October. And those two periods, March to early May and September to October, are really good times to visit the beach. You can go to the beach, see some of these birds, um, and know that you're sort of causing minimal disturbance. From mid-July through August, um, at this point, uh, at least in New York and Connecticut, a, a good number of our chicks, you know, have already fledged. Um, and uh, there are a lot of shorebirds that are passing through. Um, and as long as you are careful to give those birds enough space, um, you know, chicks that are haven't fledged yet or large groups of migratory shorebirds, you know, this is this is an okay time to visit the beach. Um, if you are going to a beach that has nesting birds, you know, the you know, if if you if you can. Um, you know, we ask that you avoid visiting the beach from mid-May to mid-June. This is really the most sensitive time uh, for our beach nesting birds. So right now, um, all of our beaches in Connecticut have very young chicks at this point. Um, you know, if the chicks get separated from their parents, they're more um, likely to um, get predated um, or, or have impacts from the weather. Um, so it's just it's a really stressful time for the birds. And so if you're, if you can hold off going to the beach until a little bit later this season, um, that is definitely be better for the birds. You can also take into account the tide when you're visiting the beach. Um, so low tide is definitely the best time to go. Um, at low tide, there is, uh, you know, the birds uh, that are sort of up in sort of stringed off, stringed off, stringed uh, fenced areas, you know, you have plenty of space to avoid those areas. Um, and if there are birds that are sort of foraging um, in the wet sand, um, there's plenty of space to for you to sort of walk around them as well. So if you can um, try to visit beaches, especially narrow barrier beaches uh, at low tide, you know, that's when it really is possible to, to share the shore. If you go at mid tide, um, you know, we ask that you stick to the wet sand. Um, you know, there's still plenty of space to sort of avoid uh, the fenced in nesting areas. Um, and if you stick to the wet stand and make a point of walking around flocks, um, you know, this can still be a good time to sort of visit the beach. We ask that you try to avoid visiting the beach at high tide. Um, you can sort of see from this image here that at high tide, there's typically very little space between um, the fenced off nesting area where the birds are nesting um, and the water line. So unless you're willing to get your feet wet, um, you know, this is, this is a time that it's best to sort of just give the birds the space that they need to care for their young and to rest. And if you're wondering how much space you should give the birds, um, we recommend at least 100 feet of space. And uh, if you're like me, you know, sometimes it's hard to judge, like, what is 100 feet? Um, it's taken many years of doing bird surveys to figure out what is 100 feet just visually. Um, but to give you an idea, that's 16 beach towels uh, or 20 dog leashes or six kayaks. So um, those are just some examples of, of what 100 feet is. And if you can give, um, you know, birds with nestlings, uh, birds with nests or good sized flocks of shorebirds 100 feet, um, it will give them uh, the space that they need to raise their young um, and rest and refuel before they continue their migrations. And with that, um, we want to thank you for joining us for uh, us for today's presentation. Um, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to tell you about uh, the birds that use the Atlantic Flyway and um, all the things that you guys can do to help them out this season and beyond. So thank you very much. And uh, we're glad to answer questions now. Yeah, well, thank you, Corey and Shelby, very much for that. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. We'll be opening up for question and answers in, a, in just a few moments. So if, you, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can with the time we have left. And joining us right now to assist with the Q&A portion of our program are uh, Beth Amendola, Audubon's Coastal Program Coordinator, and Natalie Albrecht, Audubon's Coastal Waterbird Technician. Welcome, Beth and Natalie. Um, Beth, since you popped up first, why don't you kick off the Q&A to our hosts? Great, thank you, Rich. Um, so Corey, I'll, I'll pose this great question that came up in the chat to you. Um, Patricia H. asked about fireworks along uh, the coastline, specifically in Connecticut. However, fireworks do impact a lot of our shorebirds. Uh, and her question is, uh, what should citizens of coastal communities know about potential threats 
of fireworks um, and the threats that these present to birds. Um, okay, um, well, Patricia, that, that is a great question. And um, this is, fireworks are, are a challenge to our beach nesting birds. Um, you know, if fireworks are, you know, set off um, in the vicinity of beach nesting birds, you know, there's a few things that, that can happen. Um, you know, if they're set off really right within the nesting area, um, that, that can, you know, cause, you know, say a colony of birds like least terns to potentially abandon that area and, and move on to a different area. Um, you know, we, uh, in Connecticut, we actually, um, you know, def sort of close nesting areas uh, typically during during firework events. So, um, you know, in the past, the town of West Haven or the town of Stratford have had had firework events, and the nearby nesting areas um, in, you know, so nesting area in West Haven, and then also a nesting area in Milford that's close to where the Stratford fireworks go off. Um, those areas, those areas are closed. Um, in another spot in Stratford, um, if there are nesting birds there, there are there are folks on hand to make sure that. Um, you know, people do not enter that section of that park uh, during the nesting season or during during the fireworks display. We really want to, um, you know, we ask people to give the birds, you know, 100 feet of space. But during fireworks, when, you know, there's all these loud bangs and noises, um, you know, if we can actually just completely stay out of the nesting areas, then that's sort of the way we can, the way we can keep the birds as, as sort of as calm as possible um, during during an event. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, typically, uh, you know, we are, a lot of times we are looking for volunteers too during firework events um, to sort of just help us sort of be stationed um, on the perimeter of those nesting areas and just, you know, asking people, hey, you know, if you guys can head down the beach to this other area, um, you know, this area is closed tonight just because we have all these birds here, but, you know, please feel free to head down the beach and enjoy the fireworks in other locations. So, um, Definitely, um, I think, I don't know that we need volunteers this year for fireworks, but um, certainly in future years, um, it might be uh, something we're looking for people to help us out with. That's great. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Patricia just made a, a, another comment in there. Um, and unfortunately, most of the fireworks displays that are um, cause more disturbance to the birds are the, un, the unsanctioned ones. Um, so folks, everybody likes to go off and set up their own fireworks. Um, and unfortunately, that is would be a matter for for law enforcement to to deal with if, if that is something going on in your area. And then um, we had another question from Mercedes G. Um, and she asked generally, what are the rules if there are any regarding drone usages near nesting areas or in the flyway? Um, so I'll take that question. Um, one of the important things that um, any drone user really should know is that there are no drone, like no fly spaces, um, especially in Connecticut that border a lot of um, uh, airports. Uh, but overall, most nesting habitats do have a, like do say no drones. Um, it really does though depend on each like beach area. Um, but it is, preferred that the that drone users do not fly over nesting colonies uh, birds can uh, interact with them it can lead to injuries uh, nest drones can crash and unfortunately end up in colonies which can also injure birds uh, both the adults and chicks so it is uh, it is preferable to not uh, fly drones over uh, nesting beaches Great, thanks oh, I got a question then um... The uh, exclosures that Shelby, both you and Corey had, had uh, dis described uh, briefly, I think Shelby, you showed one that had been flooded out. Um, are those exclosures, are they there you know, permanently and then birds find them to nest under or are they set up over nests uh, on an annual basis? And how's, how's, what, are, what exactly are those things, I guess is the question. I guess I'm asking Shelby, but Corey, feel free to answer that as well. Um, so, Piping plover exclosures um, and the exclosure structure is only used for piping plover nests. Um, it's usually made out of uh, like chicken wire. Uh, they are put right over a fully a full piping plover nest, so about four eggs. Um, they are they are placed as soon as the net the nest is it has a full clutch, and they do stay for the remainder of the season, uh, mostly due to the fact that least terns and other colony nesters do test tend to nest around um, in those same areas so as to not disturb 
uh, nesting leaf turns or common turns, we do leave those exclosures in place until the birds leave. Uh, but once those pi uh, piping plover chicks hatch, uh, they don't tend to see the exclosure as uh, like a home, like a home base. They do kind of work or like walk around the beach um, and don't really use it like as added protection. Um, and I do want to note those exclosures are put up by trained staff. Um, and so it is something that usually both Audubon Connecticut, Connecticut staff or Audubon New York staff or the land manager who oversees uh, shorebirds would be the ones who would put those exclosures in. Uh, Corey, there's another really good question in the um, chat here about um, really, is there anything that folks can do to help keep fish crows away from chicks? That is a, that is a good question. Um, you know, fish crows are, corvids are, are some of the smarter, smarter uh, avian predators. And, um, you know, definitely we have uh, occasionally noticed that they will sort of pick up on the fact that there, if there's an exclosure that eventually there might be a chick that emerges from that exclosure. Um, I think one of the things that that Audubon will do is if we notice this association between um, or Audubon and partners, if we notice this association between chicks and the exclosures, we will actually stop putting exclosures around the nests so that there isn't like this you know, big chicken wire fence sort of marking, hey, there's a nest here. Um, but for the public, I would say that, it, you know, just not leaving trash on the beach, um, anything we can do to reduce, um, you know, the sort of, you know, trash can basically attract things like fish crows um, and other um, predators, you know, like seagulls, um, you know, mammals like foxes, raccoons, opossums, it will attract them to beaches. So if we can be, you know, very conscious of carrying in and carrying out, you know, if you're coming to the beach, if you bring a sandwich, bring a trash bag so you can bring it back out and ideally take the trash bag home with you too. Um, you know, sometimes a lot of municipalities will have, you know, trash containers at their beach, but maybe they're only getting, um, you know, emptied once a week. So sometimes they're overflowing. And so really a, a carry in carry out trash policy is really helpful for um, reducing um, the number of fish crows and other predators that are attracted to beaches. And Shelby, I have a question from Nick K. And he asked, um, is movement or noise more disruptive to birds or is there a certain disturbance that's more disturbing? Um, yeah. So we would say definitely in like coming close to shorebirds is gonna cause a large disturbance. Um, not only does it cause them to be on alert, but if these are adults that are brooding chicks, they will use their energy to lead predators or lead people away from those chicks or nests. Um, that's using a lot of their energy. It then also leads that nest and those chicks um, open to predation, leads those chicks open to, or it leaves those eggs open to you know, the elements. And so that is a big disturbance factor. Um, when it no when it comes to noise, I'm assuming they're like referring to fireworks, um, car horns. Um, we do see that sometimes as a, a can affect birds, but it's definitely more of that encroaching on their space. We definitely want to give them that hundred feet of space when possible. We want to stay out of that fencing, um, and we also want to keep dogs and things away that might chase shorebirds while they're roosting. And thanks, Shelby. Corey, I got a question for you. Some people want to know about that thruple of oyster catchers there in Connecticut. Is it uh, is it two males and a female, or or or, or the other way? And uh, do, do all do all three of the birds take care of the nest? That's a question for Shelby. Actually, it's uh, it's on Lido Beach in New York where that's taking place. Um, yeah. So that's actually one of the great things about uh, the banding of oyster catchers. It does allow land managers and Audubon to observe the different behaviors um, of nesting. Uh, American oyster catchers. And over the year, they did find out that there is a thruple um, on Lido Beach on the south shore of Long Island. Uh, it is one male and two a female American oyster catchers that have two nests. So yeah. Um, and they'll just learn more uh, from this, uh, from this American oyster catcher <laughs> group.
So I also just want to bring up another question. Um, someone was mentioning that they've noticed on um, some areas that vehicles are allowed to park right up along the fencing. Um, in Connecticut, we don't allow any driving on our beaches, but um, Shelby, I, I guess we'll pose this one to you because in some places, New York, they can still drive on beaches. Um, what kind of threat does that cause to our, our fresh little hatchlings? So yes, yeah, so in New York, uh, both um, government officials on certain beaches, land managers do have ability to drive. Um, also out on the east end of Long Island, there are sites where people are still allowed to recreationally drive out on the beach. Uh, land managers do take precautions. Um, any driver is usually educated. Um, they have a top speed that they're required to do. If nesting, if chicks are in the area, they are educated on that. Um, in some cases, stewards do have to walk with vehicles depending on the type of vehicle. Um, if an unknown driver is coming on due to maybe like a, uh, you know, a medical emergency or something like that, that driver would then be escorted by a steward. It does, unfortunately, as we mentioned in the presentation, vehicles can uh, be a risk to our piping clovers and multiple shorebirds. Uh, one of the things that people don't realize is that those really deep uh, tire tracks uh, can lead a ditch that uh, a chick can fall into. Um, it can so that it can leave them stranded and unable to climb out of. One of those things is that if you do, uh, along with that, if you do see like a hole in the sand, like a very big ditch that somebody um, like dug out, it's good to fill in that on a nesting beach uh, because a shorebird could fall into it and could lead to um, a death. And Corey, um, I'll pose this question to you. Uh, so Dorothy commented and she was referring to Harkness a Park in Connecticut where we have a handful of birds um, and she's noticed frequently there people um, not following signage, um, entering into uh, areas they're not supposed to be in, launching kayaks in places they're not supposed to be, um, and was just wondering what are the best ways to handle a situation if you're at um, a breeding site and you're seeing something like this happening and maybe there's uh, not a staff or a tech that's visible or out. I think, you know, this, there is, you know, uh, if you see something that, you you know, it doesn't look good, um, you know, we do have volunteers that um, work on our beaches and, you know, we do ask them to, you know, if they see somebody that's in a, an area that's closed or inside the string of bites fencing, you know, we do ask them to in, engage that person and, and tell them, you know, why, you know, that why they shouldn't be in that area, you know, point out that, you know, some birds to them and sort of explain that, you know, these, you know, in, in Connecticut, we've just got 60 pairs of piping plovers, you know, it's a, it's a really small number of birds, and we really need to do all we can to give them the space to, to, uh, to be able to, to raise their young. Um, you know, that said, at the same time, we don't want people to um, be in an, an uncomfortable situation. So if you uh, talk to somebody and, and they're, you know, kind of um, don't respond well to it, walk away. Um, and, you know, at that point, go try to find somebody who's on park staff, um, you know, or, um, you know, you can call um, local environmental conservation officers as well and let them know that, you know, you see people um, that are in an area that they shouldn't be in. Um, you know, and even just reporting that uh, goes goes a long way. They may not be able to get there during the time period that somebody's in that that closed off area, um, but they are aware of it. It's getting recorded. Um, and if uh, you know, there's a particular beach, and uh, very they're getting a lot of calls about people that are going into this this um, area that's closed you know, to protect the birds, they're going to start to spend more time at that location because they, they know that it is a problem. Um, you know, from a, a staff perspective, if we see, you know, things that are happening that, um, you know, are, are not good, we definitely keep a log. We collect a lot of information on sort of what we're seeing um, in sort of in a report format so that we, you know, uh, can reach out to the environmental conservation officers. And then we also can provide the data that sort of shows what's happening at that site um, so that they can then take, take action and respond. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Shelby, I had a question for you. Um, you, you uh, people want to know how they can pledge to be a good egg. Everybody wants to be a good egg, of course, but um, you, you showed a picture, it looked like someone was actually signing something. Um, how can one make this pledge? Oh, so you're on mute. 
So we do have a website that you can go to sign the Be A Good Egg pledge online. Um, in our PowerPoint, we additionally added a QR code um, that we implemented in 2021 um, as a social distancing measure. So people can scan that QR code. It does take them directly to the Be A Good Egg pledge. Um, but we can also drop uh, the Be A Good Egg pledge in the chat. <laughs> like magic. Um, so yeah, so signing that is a really great way. Um, and then we, that is the pledge that we do ask people to sign um, when we are doing our Be A Good Egg outreach. So Corey, there have been a couple of questions about um, piping plover and American oyster catcher uh, behavior after hatching. Um, so one was referring to oyster catchers. Um, after they hatch, do the chicks and the adults stay near the nesting area? And the other was with regards to piping plovers as well. After they hatch, do they stay in the nesting area? And is that why we keep our string fencing up um, almost till migration? Those are, are good questions. So um, after the, the nest hatch, um, the, the piping plover chicks and the oyster catcher chicks are, are fairly mobile. Um, you know, maybe for the next first six hours, they might sort of stay near the nesting area. Um, you know, sometimes the chicks don't all hatch at the same time. So the first chick might have hatched and sort of just curled up next to mom while she continues to incubate the, the remaining eggs. Um, but then once they are all mobile, um, they will move around. Now we keep the fencing up because that is kind of this safe area that they can go, um, but they do need to leave that string fenced area um, periodically to forage. Um, you know, Shelby mentioned that, you know, uh, birds find their food from, you know, down by the water. So the plovers um, and the oyster catchers, um, you know, parents and adults, parents and chicks will make their way down to the water to forage. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, so when, if you are, you know, even though the fenced area is sort of the fenced area where you expect them to be, it's, you know, if you're walking along a beach that has nesting birds, it's good to keep an eye out for them even outside of the fenced in areas um, because they may, you know, might have these chicks with their parents occasionally making trips down to the water line um, to forage for, for crustaceans and insects. Um, so they, they are pretty mobile. They can move around quite a lot. Um, a lot of the times, um, if it's a really hot day, um, you might actually see the chicks hanging out underneath what little bits of vegetation there are uh, um, on the uh, on on the, the, the beach. So um, uh, it's a it's kind of a good thing that they can move there. It is sort of means that they can move away from predators. They can move away from stressful situations. Um, but it also means that they are not always in the string fence area. They may be outside of the string fence area, and that's something to just be very mindful of. Thank you. We only, we're only going to have time for about one more question. We have a very curious group today, too, and there's going to be a lot of questions we haven't gotten to, uh, especially about site-specific site stuff, uh, particular beaches. Um, and we can follow up on that. I'll drop in the chat um, the uh, email addresses you can send your question to, and we'll have one of these experts get back to you uh, if you have a burning question we haven't gotten to. Um, but we have one time for one more question, then. Natalie, you want to pitch that? Yeah, yeah. So there were a couple questions, and I know Shelby and Corey kind of um, touched on this here and there, but um, about specific questions about how to get involved um, with actual on the ground monitoring, um, specifically in Connecticut and New York, respectively. Okay. Um, well, in Connecticut, um, if you are interested in in getting more involved, and in, by more involved, I would say, uh, you know, volunteering to be a, a you know a beach nesting bird monitor. Um, you know, so there's uh, there's things you could do this season, and then there's more that you could do next season. So, um, you know, we're right now we're not taking any more volunteers. We have 170 people who have volunteered to help us out this season, and we are thrilled with that 170 people. But um, we started our training back in March, so it is kind of like late at this point to join, have additional volunteers join. That said, we will definitely be looking for help taking down the string fencing at the end of the summer. So, if you're interested in helping with that. Um, you can email our volunteer coordinator at ctwaterbirds at gmail.com. Um, Beth, if you want to throw that in the, uh, the, the uh, chat, that would be great so people have it. Um, and then also, if you're interested in volunteering next year, same email address, just let our volunteer coordinator know to add you to the list, and he'll get you on the list for next year. Um, and then in New York, uh, we do not uh, 
uh, volunteers don't do shorebird monitoring, but we do uh, do our outreach program, which includes our Be a Good Egg um, beach cleanup um, and our turn shelter building. So right now we actually just kicked off um, our outreach programs for the summer on June 4th with our Share the Shore Day, uh, which includes, um, which our volunteers help with doing bird walks, um, the Be a Good Egg table and multiple other events. Um, right now we are still looking for volunteers for our Be a Good Egg events, um, which we can send after this um, um, webinar because there are quite a few days ranging right now um, from June all the way until August of Be a Good Egg events that we do in Oyster Bay. Um, on the South Shore at Jones Beach and Lido, um, at West Meadow, and at Sunken Meadow. Thanks, um, um, Well, that's all the time that we have today. Uh, so all, all the registrants today will be receiving an email in the next couple of days with a recording of this, as well as all of the many links uh, to um, how to sign the pledge and, 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 and other links to the programs um, in case they want to get more involved or, or learn more. Um, but thank you for joining us today. And thanks to Corey and to Shelby and to Natalie and Beth. Thank you very much. Um, and our next webinar is scheduled for uh, August 17th and will feature BBC host Patrick Airy, who will present to us some biomimicry and how animals and especially birds inspire human ingenuity. Thanks everyone and have a great afternoon.